Okay, gentlemen, good morning. If I could ask you just to grab a seat, and uh, I'll introduce Dr. Montoya in just a moment. Just want to make sure we have this on. There we go. Guys in the distance locations, can you hear me? Okay, good. Thumbs up. Great. Okay, welcome. Uh, good to have you guys back, those of you returning, and uh, it's nice to see you. Some of you guys have grown beards over the break, maybe too long of a break for you, um, but great to see you guys. want to make a couple announcements. Um, Dr. Montoya will be taking attendance. Guys at the distance location, I'm going to uh, get you Aaron Filbrin's email address, and if you could just email him. Uh, each day and let him know your attendance. He'll, he'll record that for you as well. And then um, the official class time each day is from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, depending on when the break comes, that, um, that may change. Uh, but you're, that's the official class time for this. So we'll be starting at 8 a.m. each morning. And <laughs> ASB, uh, I believe, has, uh, for those of you who are here on campus, has decided to provide coffee and snacks in the kitchen right next door here. Um, the D-Men guys are meeting across the hall and they have a snack and coffee lounge at the end in room 375. Please don't confuse the kitchen here with the D-Men uh, snack area at the end of the 370s. Um, and then uh, I've I believe everyone should have access to Canvas. Is there anybody who doesn't have access to Canvas and to the syllabus yet? All right. I, are you registered for the class? Mm, I did take a look. Okay. If you if you have problems with uh, registration, come talk to me. Uh, I, I'm doing the academic administration for this course, and uh, I'm also going to be in charge of the assignments. And so, if you have questions about the assignments, and I just want to go over them. Uh, briefly here as we begin, and I'll, I'll make, have a time for questions about them later if, if those arise, or you can just, I'll be on campus this week, you can come ask me or send me an email. Um, for those of you who are at distance locations or may not know me, I'm Brian Biedebach. I'm on faculty here. My email address is bbiedebach at tms.edu, and you could probably find that, I think, on the, the web if you need it. Um, oh, it's on the syllabus as well. Um, 
let's see here. So attendance and participation is 10% of the course grade. You, um, you're allowed uh, the equivalent of one day skipping. So if you're sick or something like that, please, please let me know so I could uh, uh, try and, and uh, keep you in the loop on things. But um, uh, if you miss more than one day, unfortunately, um, that's going to impact whether or not you're going to be able to stay in this course. It's only a five-day course, so you'll be missing almost half the course. Um, the, the reading uh, is 30% of your course grade, and I'll have something on, on um, Canvas before the due date of that that you can, if it's not there already, where you can sign off on that. Each day, uh, beginning today, we're going to have daily quizzes. Dr. Montoya has written quiz questions that are based off of the lectures. So there'll be about 10 questions, if I remember the true and false questions each day. Um, and that should open up on Canvas at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Pacific time. And uh, it's, that quiz will close at 7.50 the next morning. So just be aware of that if you decide to come in early tomorrow morning and you want to get here at, you know, 7.45, you've got five minutes to take the quiz. Um, but otherwise, you should have 10, 15 minutes to take the quiz. And um, I think it's a 10-minute time limit on the quiz. But it shouldn't be a problem if you're listening in class, taking notes. And then um, what I'm going to try and do is give the results of the quiz by percentage to Dr. Montoya each day. So if there's an issue that uh, a, a number of guys struggled with, he can try and deal with that the next day. Can I ask someone to close the doors? Um, the, um, the sermon evaluation project is the main project for this course. Um, you are to view or listen to the five sermons that are listed in the syllabus. Um, there are five different preachers there. They're all preaching about the same passage from the same text. And uh, the first couple of pages, it doesn't need to be formatted in, uh, according to our style guide. It's basically uh, typed out notes that you take while you're observing the sermon. I'm looking for you to, I'm looking to see how you're able to follow it as far as verse numbers, as far as uh, plural noun proposition statement. Um, the main points, I want to see if you're getting, uh, you know, if the, if, the, if the preacher is able to communicate those and if you're able to follow that. Uh, you can fill it in as, as detailed as you want. It, it can be longer than two pages, but it really, that section really shouldn't be more than four pages. So uh, I'm just looking for not detailed notes, but I'm looking for more than just half a page. Um, and uh, the rest of the assignment, which should be, again, at least two pages, um, would be uh, a, a written review of the sermon. Uh, what role did passion play in the sermon? How do, would you identify passion? How would you define passion uh, as that sermon? Each one of the preachers has a different personality that comes through, different style of preaching. And so um, where could have they improved? What was really excellent? What did you learn from it? Those are the kind of observations I'm looking for uh, on the, the, the second part of that assignment. And again, that could be anywhere from two to four pages. We're not looking for, uh, I forget what I put on the actual syllabus, but minimum of four pages uh, is what we're looking for. But no more than six or eight, really. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, a term paper. And it... And uh, again, the, um, I'm concerned more about content than formatting. Uh, the, the last section should be formatted, uh, complete sentences and so forth. I don't need a title page. I shouldn't need a bibliography. Um, so, but it should be in paragraph form. And you should write according to the style guide on the, the second section of that paper. OK? Um, there's a late assignment policy that's in there as well, and I think you know the grading scale. Any questions about the assignments? All right. Great. Well, um, I'd like to pray with you, and then I'll introduce Dr. Montoya. Let's pray.
Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you for this course. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to prepare to preach your truth. Lord, we, um, we just think about how humbled we are that we can even call upon your name and that you would listen to us, much less that we could be heralds of your truth to a world that desperately needs to hear it. And so I pray, Lord, that you would use Dr. Montoya, that you would, that you would take this course and impact many men, Lord, who would be able and willing to continue to proclaim your truth and that this would better equip them not only to proclaim your truth but internalize it in their own lives. Uh, that it might percolate and just flow out of them in a natural sense where the hearer could listen to it and apply it to the, his or her own life. And we thank you, Father, again for this place, for the Master Seminary. We thank you for um, the work that you have done here in the past and that you are continuing to do. And we ask that you would just bless this week as really an enriching time for these men. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think most of you know Dr. Montoya. He was one of my professors when I was here in the early 90s. Uh, he was a full-time faculty member here for more than 22 years, or 22 years, and then he uh, continues to come and teach from time to time. Uh, and so we're grateful for him. Prior to uh, teaching here, he taught at Talbot Seminary for about a decade, and he uh, has been preaching and pastoring at First Fundamental Bible Church uh, in Whittier, California, since 1972. And so how many of you were uh, born after 1972? All right. I put My hand was up, but I should, shouldn't have been. But anyways, uh, <laughs> great. Well, um, please come, brother, and uh, encourage these men. Sorry, for the guys who are at distance locations, uh, it's our preference that if you have questions, uh, if you can email Aaron Filbrin with those questions rather than uh, log in through the intercom, um, then during the Q&A times on that day or on the following day, then uh, Dr. Montoya will, will try and deal with those questions. So that's our preference. Uh, if you have questions about that, um, please feel free to email me as well, okay? Thanks. Well, thank you, Brian, so much for being a great help in this class. Where were you 22 years ago when I needed you? <coughs> yeah. Well, buenos dias, hermanos. This is Southern California now, remember. <laughs> we're going to uh, pass out an attendance sheet, so just go ahead and autograph uh, next to your name uh, that you were here for the class session. So we'll do that every, every day. And uh, so you go ahead and do that. I'll hopefully get a chance to uh, get to know you uh, throughout the next uh, four or five days that we spend time together. Um, let me just give you my testimony for a few moments as by way of introduction so we get a chance to know each other. Um, I was saved out of a Roman Catholic background, and uh, my, my family was nominal. Um, Mama was nominal Catholic. Dad was nothing. He was raised uh, an Adventist in his background, but he was really nothing. And so, you know, the process of uh, being involved in Catholicism that I received a, um, a deep sense of uh, guilt and the need to need to know God, uh, so much so that I even felt a desire to go into the into the priesthood. That that became one of my objectives. Uh, again, in Catholicism, it's all a works. It's a it's a system of works. So the more you work and the more you give, the more assurance you get. But uh, in the process in high school, things really began to get really, really tough for me. And I began a, a quest to uh, outside my church. First of all, I became involved in my church in Catholicism. Uh, went, went to mass, catechism, provoking other classmates to do the same thing. And that didn't satisfy me. So eventually we branched out started visiting other, other churches. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, uh, old, old school, that is like a mortal sin. For you to visit other churches would be like 
major, major Ichabod. And yet we had to do that. So I began to attend uh, uh, Assemblies of God, um, Mormons, study with the Mormons, and Seventh-day Adventists. And eventually was being, made contact with an evangelical church in my small town of Calexico, which is like 99% Catholic. And uh, there was a missionary down there doing missionary work. I had a chance to meet, uh, meet my wife in the high school band. And we became friends. She introduced me to her church. And I heard uh, gospel preaching for the first time, where the preacher actually opened the Bible and began to read and explain the scripture. I had never seen that ever. And that just caught my attention. And in the process, and I, I, I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. And uh, when, when that took place, like my eyes were open that this is God's word and talked about Christ and salvation. And so by the uh, spring of my senior year, I, I just felt the desire to give myself to the teaching of God's word. I uh, understand I had no idea what it meant to be a pastor or a minister or anything like that. All I knew was that this is God's word. We didn't have it. Somebody should teach it. I'll volunteer. And that's what I did. And so I spoke to my counselor, and I said, I want to be um, involved in teaching the Bible. Where, where can I go to be a pastor? And so she recommended uh, USC School of Religion for me to go there. And I had no idea of where to go. But by chance, the Lord in Providence, the Lord moved me to go to, instead of USC School of Religion or Pepperdine, to go to uh, Biola. Uh, university, Biola College, and eventually Talbot Seminary. That's where I met our Dr. MacArthur. He was already out of the seminary when I started, and uh, he was the uh, school representative preaching all over the country, uh, introducing folks to our seminary. And uh, that began, um, and my quest was to go back to my town to preach Christ, go back to uh, Calexico, little small border town, and preach Christ. And then eventually probably go into Mexico, become a missionary, and preach Christ there. And uh, then upon, when I finished seminary, I felt I wasn't quite ready for that. I needed some experience. I was only 20, you know, 26 six years of age, and I needed some, some, you know, some, some gray hair or some experience. So we decided to take a church uh, in, in East L.A., of all places, which is like 100% Hispanic. And... Uh, Best place to be to get accustomed to the culture. We had planned to be there for five years. And five years has become 46 years now, so we're still there ministering, you know, God's word. Um, in the process of uh, shepherding there at, 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 at East L.A., in our, the same church that we're at now, uh, God opened a door for me to help at Talbot Seminary teaching uh, elements of Greek. So we taught for 10 years elements of Greek and theology, et cetera. And then we took a time off for five or six years, and then 1991, we were invited to come and participate here at the Master Seminary and spent 22 years teaching, uh, preaching, pastoral ministry, church leadership. It's been a delightful, delightful time. But at my heart, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. So when the time came for me to give up one of them, either seminary or the church, uh, there wasn't a question. It was a matter of, well, seminary would have to go and because uh, I need to preach I need to be involved in the exposition of God's word get out involved in doing those things so I'll devote myself to that so I'm still doing that full-time pastoring the church there we moved we moved to Whittier and uh, we're doing uh, preaching there I used to preach three times a week Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday nights and did that for 35 years now we're we cut back to Sunday morning and Sunday nights so that'll be the extent of our preaching so I love, I love ministry, love preaching, and I love teaching at the seminary. So I'm here with you for the next, uh, next uh, for today through Friday then at your disposal to be a, a friend to you, to help you along the way. If you need, uh, need to spend time with me, uh, talk to me. We can arrange a luncheon together or probably on Thursday and meet together for lunch at the faculty lounge and and then spend time talking. If something in private, I have an email. You can you can do that, or just between um, after class, talk to me, etc. I want our class to be practical. Um, our theme is preaching with passion, and uh, we have <clears throat> set aside two books for you to read. Uh, are obviously, yours truly, preaching with passion, and then a new one that just came out, "Passion in the Pulpit," by Jerry Vines and Adam Dooley. 
Uh, there aren't very many books that deal with the topic just by itself. Usually it's, chapter, it's a chapter in one of the books on preaching. Uh, so rarely, uh, I, there are very, uh, aside from these two books, I can't think of another other set of books that just deal with the whole idea of passion and preaching as a topic by itself. But that'll be our theme for, um, for the week, and uh, I want to make it practical so that we will walk through this uh, whole element of preaching. I'm going to allow some time uh, at the end of every day for questions and answers that might have to do with just general preaching or general ministry as well. Uh, we have some pastors here or some of you involved in ministry. If you have some questions concerning that, we'd love to address them and answer them along the way. So, you know, mark them down. We want the class to be very practical and helpful to you. Well, we'll divide the schedule. I think we'll divide the schedule by um, maybe lect lecturing for an hour and a half from nine, 8 to 9.30, and then we'll take a 15, 20-minute break, uh, get your coffee, wake up, and, uh, and then come back and resume our discussion till the close of the class. We'll do it that way. If you need to, uh, an emergency comes up and you need to uh, visit the men's room, well, then just slither out uh, quietly and uh, do your business and come back. But we'll, we'll try and use that schedule and see if, how that works. And so we'll divide, uh, we'll divide the class session in relation to, do, to that, covering probably two themes per day. Uh, our, our book has eight chapters, and uh, we'll, we'll cover probably two, two chapters per day when it comes to the actual themes that we will cover concerning preaching with passion. So we'll look at that. The, uh, the grading will be done by my brother Brian. What a great help he's going to be. So any, any questions on, on grading and things like that, just bother him. Uh, that's why you pay him. You pay him. He works for you. So use him at, uh, as much as you can. And then I'll be your, uh, your servant when it comes to the whole idea of preaching. All right? And uh, as we lecture, we go through the class. I uh, want the class to be interactive, so if you have any questions about the discussion at hand, uh, go ahead and just raise your hand, and then uh, give me your name, and then uh, ask your question, and we'll address the question and resolve it as best we can. I, I don't have all the answers when it comes to preaching, but I know that we have many of the answers when it comes to preaching, and it's a, it's a great, a great uh, task that God has given us. My, my uh, desire would be to provoke you, provoke you to become a preacher of God's word. I mean, to put some fire in your, in your soul, put some chile jalapeno in your veins, okay, and get you somewhat provoked when it comes to the area of preaching. All right? So let's uh, open our notes to the, um, the introduction, uh, introduction section. I'd like to spend a few moments before we get into the whole idea of preaching, just introducing, introducing the preacher itself, talking about ourselves, who we are when it comes to preaching. So let's, let's think about for a few moments the whole idea of being called to preach. In 2 Timothy, uh, let's, let's uh, address ourselves by going to 2 Timothy, very familiar text, but I think it would be good for us to meditate upon that this morning as we, know, we begin this section on, on preaching. The Apostle Paul addressing Timothy, and uh, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, in verse 14, verse 14, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Our scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God <clears throat> may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, 
they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This text is very special to me because it reminds me of my calling, and probably on a weekly basis, I open the text and read it, just read it. It, it's, not, it's not something that I take for granted. I stop and look at it. And I want us to look at the text this morning in our first session just for a few moments. But think about the call that God has given us. Throughout the epistles, First and Second Timothy, you'll note that the apostle is addressing his, his disciple Timothy. And uh, though we usually take Paul as our, as our model, Really, it's Timothy that most of us will identify with. There are a few around here that are Pauline in conduct and in nature, and most of us fit in the other category of the Timothys. And so when you read through the epistles, they really speak to you. They resound what we really need to hear from God. Now think of the call. The call to preach involves, first of all, the character of the preacher. It's who you are. It's who we are as men of God before what we say. The, uh, the nature of who we are, the character of the preacher is by far the most important part of preaching. This is why as you work through the epistles, you'll find that Paul is working on Timothy's character, working on his character. Matter of fact, if you turn to 1 Timothy 3, along with Titus chapter 1, you'll, you'll receive the... Um, the qualifications for what it means to be a, be a pastor or be, a, be an overseer in a church. And most of us are acquainted with the discussions in chapter 3 uh, where the apostle tells to Timothy, listen, Timothy, uh, an overseer must be above reproach. And then he goes through a, 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 a litany of qualifications of what it means to be uh, an elder, to be a bishop, to be an, an overseer. And he describes what the man is like. The same thing in Titus, Titus chapter 1, verse 5. He says, I left you in Crete now because you need to set in order the things that remain. You're the church planner, you're a church planner, Titus. Now go and finish the job. And that is appoint elders in every church, and these are the qualifications of an elder. And he goes and identifies who they are. We uh, in the modern church have taken these qualifications and basically threw them out the window. In the, the, modern, the modern denominations don't think of these qualifications as necessary for the pastor. So I have these, battle, these battles taking place in all the major den denominations concerning qualifications for leadership. Some are ordaining women to the ministry. Others are ordaining homosexuals to the ministry or ordaining anybody that wants, to, wants the job. You know, apply for the job, wide open, you know, just come and the job is yours. But... You and I that are biblical and desire to obey God recognize that these are really qualifications for ministry. These, these are the standards that God, this is a standard God has given us. And, and the standard is the standard for a Christian. I tell my people many times, you know, when we come to these qualifications, these aren't just for me, they're also for you. You know, if it's wrong for the preacher to steal, it's wrong for you to steal. If it's wrong for the preacher to lie, it's also wrong for you to lie. If it's wrong for the pastor not to get along with people, then it's also wrong for you. Not, there, are, there are not two standards, one for you, one for me. The standards are for everybody. We are all held to this high standard. This is what Christians ought to be. The only difference is that for the pastor, he needs to be this. You know, these are requirements. For the believer, they are the goals. <laughs> That's what we... We're striving to be these things, but for, for the preacher, these are absolute requirements. And so these are basically character qualities. So as you work through these, you recognize that. 
So gentlemen, as you pursue your studies in seminary or you get involved in ministry, you look at the list of qualities that are given here and they are, they are musts. They are must. They're not something that you dabble at or uh, you, you meet most of them. They are a must. Every single one of these is an absolute requirement as you and I get involved in ministry. And it's good for us to then go through that and insist on it, not only for ourselves as we shepherd, but also for the men we appoint to office to become part of our elder board, even part of our deacon board, because the deacons are held also to the, almost to the same standard except for just minor adjustments. And so these are standards for those that will be leading the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice that they're divided in three broad categories. There are the what I call the personal, for your personal life, what you are yourself before God. And so as you walk through the list in Titus and Timothy, some of these apply to who you are as an individual believer, your personal walk with God. The, uh, the Eusebius or Eusebia that God speaks about, your godliness, your godliness before God your conduct, your walk before the Lord. And this is who, who we are. And so in our personal life, it, it emphasizes these things. It also speaks about your family life, your family life. It speaks about the fact that we are, if you are a husband, now you don't need to be a husband to be a pastor. It's not that you have to be one, but if you are one, then it calls for you to be a one woman, man. And the whole idea is, is taking the absolute description of that to a quality that you are a loving, faithful husband to your wife. That's what it means. Not that you've just been married and don't have a divorce problem. That's not the issue. The issue is you're married and you love your wife and you're devoted to her, a one woman man. You might put next to that 1 Peter 3.7 which is uh, Peter's uh, admonition to husbands and how they ought to treat their wives and why. And uh, it is a one text that basically encompasses everything that a man should be doing with his wife. And so as you work through this process in seminary and you're cultivating, you're cultivating a, 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 a precious wife, that you're going to love and you cherish, you're devoted to her, you're faithful, and, and that is really, you know, uh, a, a, a goal. Uh, mark it down, gentlemen. If you lose your wife, you lose your ministry. Okay, you say it now. Yeah. If you lose your family, guess what? You lose your ministry. And so he emphasizes that. So don't ever minimize the importance that, that you have. And if you're in seminary now, part of your process is to disciple your wife. She may not sit in class with you here, but she is, um, she's part of your preparation to make sure that she is everything that, that, that she needs to be. She actually is your first disciple. If you can't disciple her, then you can't disciple anybody because you're with her 24-7. And so in, this, in actuality, she'll be your disciple. She'll be the one you'll be working on. So the idea is to love your wife and then to have your children under control with all dignity. That is that you, that they are actually obedient and in submission to your will. Um, the whole idea is the operation of your children, of your household is going to test your ability to lead. That's what Paul says. If you can't govern your home, what makes you think you can govern what? The church. If you can't, if you can't tear, take care of three or four little black beady-eyed sheep in your house, what makes you think you're going to take care of a hundred <laughs> nasty ones in the church? And so the whole idea is that it tests your ability to lead. That's why it's key. It's key to examine. Now, mark it down because your children are going to experience times of rebellion, times of um, you know, reaction against, uh, against the Lord, against your authority. Uh, we all go through that. And that is not a, that's not a disqualifying factor because all that is doing is testing your ability to lead. 
when your children go through these times, how do you handle it? How do you work them through this process? How do you help them deal with questions of faith or when they, when they question your authority or they, they question your wife's authority? How do you work through that? How do you resolve that? How do you bring them full circle to, again, put them under, under, uh, under, uh, under authority and submission to you, not ruthlessly, but so they understand why they are who they are? And when you go through those rough waters and you come out, then you've shown yourself to be a leader because that's what takes place in the church. Uh, in a church, you're going to have believers that will become ruly, that will become sometimes, uh, you know, rowdy and, and uh, you know, anti-authority or go through issues and problems. And it's not that they, it doesn't, that doesn't disqualify you. What disqualifies you is can you resolve those issues? Can you take them through the process? Can you guide them through that? so that they are restored and brought back to the fold and then continue in the way they ought to go. That's why it's, it's the test. It's the test. You, some of you are newly, you know, you're, you're young parents. Your kids are like two, three, four, five years old. It's easy to pontificate upon being a good father. Wait till they turn 13, 14, and 15, and they become little gremlins or demons in your home. Then it's a whole different ballgame. Okay? It's a, the, the, now, you're not... <laughs> Your skills are being tested. But so you see, so it's this process that the Lord is training us. And in, in, in so he requires these things that you be then above reproach in your personal life, above reproach in your family life, and above reproach as you deal with people in the public life. And so in those list of qualifications in Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, some of these apply to me and myself, and others apply to me and you, how I treat you, how I, how I interact with you as a fellow believer in Christ, as a fellow member of the body of Christ. There's a whole then list of those things. That's all under the title of people skills. Can I get along with people? Can I get along with people? And what what the apostle admonishes Timothy is that a pastor, a bishop, should know how to get along with people. Because you have to get along with everybody in the body of Christ. You can't just be partial. And, and you know, throughout the epistle, he, he encourages Timothy not to have an attitude of partiality. You know, you, you can't just choose people that you want to have in your church. God chooses them. I mean, there's some folks in our church that I, I wouldn't choose to have in my church. But God has chosen them to be there, so they're part of the flock. And my wife have this, and I have this ongoing uh, discussion. I'll say, you know, those are members of your church, not mine, you know. <laughs> and so we go back and forth with them. But <clears throat> they're there, and uh, they're there for us to love them. <clears throat> and so our, our ability to deal with people then is tested. And so God is saying here, listen, listen, gentlemen, he says, you need to know how to get along with people. Your people skills are so, so important. And, and you start now, you start now in relation to do that, to learn to get along with people. And notice he adds even a verse, not just get along with believers, but guess what? Get along with unbelievers, unbelievers. Because sometimes we draw the line. And we treat believers like really great things, and then unbelievers, a whole different ballgame. It's like a church. All right? You have one face, and then you go to Marie Callender's for lunch, and then there's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mentality, and you treat the waitress like she's a piece of dirt. I didn't order this. This is not what I ordered. It's cold. Take it back. And she's like an unbeliever. And God is saying, listen, the way you treat them is also qualifies you or disqualifies you for ministry. How do you relate to those that are unbelievers? And so it's, it's important for us then to recognize that these lists of qualities and their character qualities, this is what we are. And it takes a while for us to be tested in these areas. Now, to fail in one of these in your Christian life does not disqualify you. If you were a gangbanger before you came to Christ, it doesn't disqualify you. 
If you're in jail for some misdemeanor, whatever, and you came out, you're not disqualified. Now, what is your care? What is your life like? What has it been for the last 10, 15 years? What is what is your habit? What is your character like? Because you're actually that's going to be the test of who you are. Now, for us to violate some of these in the ministry will in many times disqualify us from ministry. If they are grievous enough and scandalous enough, will disqualify us from ministry. But I say that so that you and I would never lose sight that who we are is much more important than what we say. If you notice the list in Timothy, all the lists that are given, there's only one of them that has to do with actual ministry, apt to teach. Remember that one? Apt to teach is the only one of all the list of, of, of categories of what we ought to be. That's only one that actually applies to the actual exercise of the speaking gift. In Titus, it ends, it ends by reminding the elders that they ought to be those that hold the faithful word and are able then to exhort and rebuke. But that comes at the very end, after it goes through the explanation of what the man ought to be. In my years of experience in ministry, gentlemen, <clears throat> I, I can almost say with uh, almost 100% that more men will lose their ministry based on their character and not based on their ability to preach or to do ministry. So take that down. You'll have more men that will be disqualified from ministry or asked to leave the ministry or not be hired in the ministry because of character, not because they can't preach or not because they can't minister effectively. So this is important for us to note that, so that we make, we make working on character the most important part in our preparation. So as you work, as you spend your time in ministry, you spend your time in school here, uh, that may not be emphasized at every class, but don't, don't you neglect that and say, for me, character is most important. Who I am is going to be a much more value than anything else that I've ever done. And so I want to say that because we want to make sure that we are focusing on, on being rather than on doing. And though we, we love ministry, we love preaching, and it's going to be a major part of our life, if we aren't, aren't who we're supposed to be, everything's in vain. I mean, you're going to drop, you're going to drop, <laughs> what is it, 40 grand. When you get done with this seminary, you're going to drop 40 grand into Brian Biedebeck's pocket, okay? <laughs> or somebody's pocket. And it'd be such a, 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 a waste of investment to spend that much and then to be disqualified from ministry. Agreed? It just would not be the wisest investment. And so recognize that the chances of you not being hired for your skills doesn't equal you not being hired for who you are or kept for who you are. So who you are is by far most important. And so always receive the feedback from those around you, from your wife, from your children, from classmates, etc., that you are the man that you're developing into this man that God wants you to be. This is the standard we are, we are aiming at and, and want to be that. Now, will you ever achieve that in absolute perfection? There are no perfect pastors. I don't know anyone that is a perfect pastor, perfect. But we are above reproach. Above reproach means that nobody can put the finger on you and say, this is what the man is doing wrong. Um, continuously, that, that we want to be above reproach in regards to our personal <coughs> life. And so when we think of the character, we think of that. We think also, secondly, that he's faithful to the truth. The call to, the call to preach means we're faithful to the truth. In Titus, Titus 1, and as he ends the discussion on qualifications, he says, holding fast, Titus 1, 9, holding fast the faithful word. Holding fast the faithful word. That means he's really faithful to the truth that has been given to him. And this is also a, a, a part of the call to preach. It means that you and I are 
committed to believing the truth, to believe the truth. And part of our exercise in preparation for ministry is to be, be, take the truth of God and begin to believe it. Now, this is the treasure God has given us. Now, we can talk about truth. We can even articulate orthodox doctrines, but not really believe them. And, and part of the preparation for ministry is to believe, to come to terms with the truths that are found in this book and to, to believe the truth. And then, obviously, to live out this truth, to live out the truth, to be an example, to be example to the believer or of the believer. It depends on how you interpret the, uh, the text there in 1 Timothy 4.12 for you to be an example of those who believe. That is, you take the word of God and, and, and you believe it. And this is the greatest task that we have in seminary is working through and, <coughs> and, and hearing the doctrines and then owning them and, and believing them. I just thank God that when the Lord took me to a, a school for preparation, he took me to a, a school that believed the Bible and taught the Bible. I went to a seminary where all the men believed the scriptures. I mean, they were like fundamentalists, okay, to the core. And um, in my 50-some-odd years of being a believer, none of these truths that I learned have ever changed. They've, they've all stayed the same, committed, because in the process, as I learned them, I believed them, and then I owned them. <coughs> and my task now is to live it out, to make sure that I'm living out this truth, and then committed ultimately to, to teaching the truth, okay, expounding the scriptures, expounding the truth. So that is our great task. You know, the call to, the call to preach, involves being faithful, faithful to, to the truth. Let me take you to Second Timothy chapter two and verse one and following. There are two passages of scripture that also emphasize the third aspect of this call to preach, which, which means devoted, devoted to the ministry. This character of the preacher is not only a holy life, not only faithful to the truth, but also devoted to the ministry. In chapter, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy uh, 6 and following, there is, a, there is an exhortation to Timothy of a call to be devoted to the ministry. <coughs> And then it's interesting in the second epistle, chapter 2, in verses 1 through 10, almost repeats the same thing verbatim. You know, uh, Timothy, you need to be devoted to the ministry. And so just for the sake of uh, time, let me uh, take chapter 2 and use that as a basic outline. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have learned, heard, heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. If anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardships even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. <clears throat> For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. Devoted to ministry. And then when you think of the character of the preacher, there's this whole idea of being devoted. Devoted. And, and what's going to challenge our lives when it comes to service and ministry is, are we, are we devoted? And the call to preach is going to result or come out of our devotion to the ministry, you know, to make a, make a commitment to it. And, and, and so he, he emphasizes what it means to be, to have devotion. First of all, devotion to Christ. 
devotion to Christ. It begins in verse 1, you know, devotion to Christ. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, our, our foremost devotion is to Christ. And it's, to, it's to the Lord Jesus Christ. And not to the seminary, not to the church, okay? It's to Christ. I, am I devoted to Christ? Is Christ my Lord, my Savior? Do I serve him? Am I a doulos, doulos to Christu? Am I a servant of Christ? All right. And that is, that is key. Am I absolutely in devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ? Notice verse 2. Devoted to the purpose of ministry, which is people. People. Ministry is about people. Okay. Uh, ministry is not preaching. Ministry is not pastoring. Ministry is people. Let's not forget that. Ministry is people. And so he says, then in this case, verse 2, he says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of witnesses, uh, of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men to be able to teach others also. And that really means it's all about people, impacting the hearts and lives of people. We're devoted to people. Somebody said the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. And sometimes you'll be tempted to think the same thing. Man, if it wasn't for these folks, I'd be having a great time. If it wasn't for these folks, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any time. You wouldn't have a ministry. It is, it is people. People are your ministry. You know, for many years, there was a Gerber. Remember, you guys had little kids, the Gerber food, and the little kid there. I think they just changed the little photo to somebody else more contemporary. Has an earring on his ear or something along those lines. <laughs> but the motto, the motto of Gerber is, babies are our business, our only business. I like that. Babies are our business, our only business. Now, you can just change that and say people are our, minist are, are our ministry, our only ministry. That's our purpose, is people. All right. So people, think about the fact that we're devoted to people. How do you last in the same church for 46 years? How do you hang around for 46 years to the same group of people? Unless you're devoted to them. Devoted to them. Not to the facilities, not to stuff, but just to them. Devoted to them. We just buried a sister on Saturday who's been with, who was with us for over 35 years. And we just laid her to rest. She's home with the Lord. Devo she's devoted to us, but we're devoted to her as well. And so the whole idea is that when you get involved in ministry, it's going to be this whole idea of devoted to, to people. Notice thirdly, devoted to the task, verses 3 and 4. He talks about the whole idea of soldiering, hardships, and then verse 4, entanglements. You get devoted to the task, to the task. Uh, what it calls, willingness to suffer and do so as a good soldier. Now, take note of the changes in metaphors as Paul goes through this outline. Okay, take note of that because part of our class will be looking at the use of metaphors. And he'll go from, from, um, from a student to, uh, to soldiering, and from soldiering, he'll go to a farmer, and from a farmer, he'll go to an athlete, okay? He'll change all these metaphors, again, to stress the whole idea of devotion. And soldiering is obviously the epitome of devotion, of devotion. Not far from here in, in Palm Springs, just east of Palm Springs, is a training ground for our soldiers. And they were, the, uh, 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 a detachment was placed out there, and, and they forgot them. And when they finally realized that they were missing, they went back to look for them. And there they were, still out in the desert, and they died of thirst. Forgot about them. But still out there and stayed there. Stayed in their post. Devotion. There is an exhibit at the at the uh, uh, Ronald Reagan Library on Pompeii, in Pompeii, a city that was buried in ash, volcanic ash. 
they found Roman soldiers standing at their post, buried in ash, refused to leave their post because they had not, they had not been dismissed by their superiors. And that's what he means by devotion, see? Committed to the task. No one or nothing is going to move you from that. That's why he says, listen, you don't want to get entangled. And I would encourage you in the process, what are you going to be? You're going to be um, uh, in, this, in this occupation and then preach on the side, or you're going to be, have this, 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 this profession and then just teach on the side. What are you going to be? Are you, or are you going to be a pastor committed to preaching the word? So are you going to make this commitment to not be entangled in the affairs of everyday life? All right. What is, what is, your, what is your purpose? Hmm. When I was here, I, sometimes the guys would ask me, well, yeah, Professor Montoya, do you think I should buy a house when I'm here in seminary? Unless you're going to be here for the rest of your life, yeah. If, but if you're not, you don't need to buy a house. Just travel light. Don't get entangled here because then you can't leave when you need to leave. Find out what God has called you to do and then be committed to the task. All right? That's what he means here. So work through this process. And gentlemen, let me say this because I may not have another opportunity. A great problem today is we have guys in seminary that are not committed to the pastoral ministry, not committed to preaching. And so when they graduate, they really have no place to go. They have no place they want to go because they've made no commitment to it. And, and that will never do. That will never do. You need to make a commitment to the task. This is what God has called me to do. God has called me to be a pastor. God has called me to be a preacher, be a missionary, and this is it. Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, not entangled in the affairs of everyday life. Notice the next. He says, committed to the rules. And he changes the metaphor from soldier into an athlete. He says, if you operate, if you compete in the games, you compete according to the rules. There's, there's rules that are get laid out for athletes, and you have to compete according to the rules. You violate the rules, you get disqualified from, from the games. And so the same thing in ministry. There are rules for ministry. There are rules that are laid down. We'll talk about those you know, later on this week, uh, how, some of the rules that are laid down for us. But in essence, there are rules that are laid down that I have to follow. A pastor is not above the rules. A shepherd is not above the rules. We are bound by the rules. Okay, and this is so important. Never think that somehow because you are the man of God or the preacher of the God's word that you're above the rules because you're not. We have to operate within the guidelines of these rules. And it involves a lot of these things. You know, we, we have to be careful how we operate within the guidelines of the rules. And so... Um, the church's money, for example, is not your money. It's the church's money. Stuff in the office is not your stuff. It's the church's stuff. Whether it be a, whether it be a stapler or paper or even the toilet paper in the church bathroom is the church's toilet paper, not yours to take home. The phone is for church matters, not for private affairs. See, these are all the rules, the ethics of the and so we're committed to that, committed in such a way that we are always living by the rules, committed to the ethics of ministry. To be an unethical pastor would be to be disqualified when it comes to our character. And so Paul says, listen, we, we need to be committed to, you know, to ministry. And you'll notice how Paul, you know, when, when you follow Paul, like for example, when he came to the offerings and taking money from, from the, from the uh from the Macedonian churches to Jerusalem. Remember that? It's almost like it's in between. He says, uh, we're taking the money from here to Jerusalem. We want to be careful that we're above reproach, so pick some men to go with us. Church, take, appoint some men to go with us who are going to hold us accountable to this money that you've entrusted us with. And it's, that's, it came from Paul to be ethical. Versus them saying, Paul, you know, we'd like to send some men with you uh, to keep you company. Why well, don't you trust us? We're apostles. Hmm? 
Well, see, it, it, it didn't come to that. He was so concerned for ethics that he guarded himself and guarded his testimony to be always above reproach in these areas. And we need to also, you know, learn to do the same. I mean, fellows, I taught here in seminary. I'd have men that, that would cheat on exams, okay? I'd have men that lied when it came to turning in assignments in seminary. They did it here. Imagine what would happen out there. And so the temptation is here for you as well, okay, for you as well. And just learn to be a man that lives, you know, by the rules, you know, live ethically. And sometimes you may not like the rules. I mean, I don't like the rules sometimes when I, when I, when I shepherd, you know. Sometimes the board makes a decision that I don't like, but it's the board decision. And so it's made, and I need to enforce it. I need to promote it. I need to get it done, even though perhaps it's not my, my particular preference. But ethically means as a leader, I must do the will of the people and proceed with that. Notice also he says to the effort. Be committed to the effort. And so he turns to the metaphor of the farmer. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. He talks about his, his work ethic, his work ethic, hard-working, hard-working. And, uh, and this is something that we are going to, you know, be committed to. Uh, I wish I could tell you that when you finish seminary, it'll be easier. It's not, okay? It's not going to be easier. It's just going to be different. It'll be different. It'll be, in some ways, you know, more difficult. But the work ethic you start having now will be the work ethic that will follow you into the ministry. It, it won't, be, won't be easier. It'll just be different. But develop a work ethic. Be known for that. Be known for a man that is devoted to working hard at whatever you do whatever you do, like a hardworking farmer, you will be the first to receive the wages that come as a result of that. So be committed. Be known as a man that, that, that's hardworking, that, that gets the job done, that proceeds down. It. And then notice also in verses 7 through 10, it talks about the whole idea of persevering, persevering to hang in there, to not, uh, to not quit in spite of all that takes place. And then he brings himself as an example. He says, me, for example, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I persevere. In spite of my persecutions, I persevere. And I have to do it because of, this, of the people that are out there. I, I persevere for their sake. They need me. So I need to hang in there, and I need to, to not quit. Uh, you'll be tempted to quit. You'll be tempted to throw in the towel. You'll be tempted to called time out, and it'll, you'll be tempted in seminary, okay, uh, just learn to persevere, and, you know, finish the course, always continue, you'll be tempted to quit in the ministry, uh, who knows, I received a stat the other day, how thousands of men quit the ministry every single year, I can't imagine that, men called to the ministry, quitting the ministry by the thousands in America, Every single year, how could you ever do that? Unless somehow you are not committed to it, haven't learned to persevere. And so the key is persevere. And fellows, learn then to, to outlast the opposition. Okay, You'll always have opposition. Get to the point where you are going to outlast the opposition. Um, there was a video that we saw a while back. It was a... a um, a, a skunk and a, and a possum, a skunk and a possum. The skunk was trying to take over the possum's den, and they went at it. The skunk and the possum went at it. A and the skunk kept getting the, the better part of the deal and kept whipping this possum. And, and the possum would be whipped, and they would lay there like he was uh, you know, already vanquished, like plain possum. And then when the skunk would go back to walk, walk back to the den, the possum would get up and come after the skunk and thrash it. And they'd get into it again, went after it, like for who knows how long. Finally, the skunk just gave up and went away and said, possum, you can have this hole. You can have your den. It was perseverance that made the possum win. And so 
follow the analogy. All these skunks are against you. If, listen, you know, if you just if you just persevere, persevere. Okay, uh, I tell a story in one of our lectures that I think it was five years into the ministry at First Fundamental, we had an uprising of the of the troops. So the Indians had an uprising, and a group of people started to uh, make an uprising. And I heard through the grapevine that they were they were going to kick, get rid of me, vote vote me out of the ministry. Uh, some particular issue, I forget what it was, but I got wind of it. And then I got up in the pulpit, and uh, it was the days of Nikita Khrushchev. Remember that one? Where he took the shoe off and he bit, beat, the, beat the pulpit with his shoe, you know? And, um, and, and, and he used the expression, I will bury you. Remember that one? And so I got up to in the pulpit and I said, you know, some of your folks here, I heard to the grapevine, are trying to get rid of me. I want to let you know that God called me here to First Fundamental Bible Church, and I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm here to stay, and I'm going to stay here, and I will bury you. <laughs> I will bury you. Well, I've been there for 46 years, and I've buried them all. <laughs> now, all the ones that were either they left or they died, and I, and I buried them. See, that you have to have some kind of commitment, you know, devoted, that's going to uh, persevere. Persevere. You let nothing. You know. And it begins in seminary, you know, because there's stuff that happens here. You know, can't pay your tuition, work is too hard, uh, your wife gets sick, the kids get sick, you lose your job. All these thousand and ones reasons to quit, don't. Don't. If God called you here, you'll find a way. Now, it won't be easy, but you'll find a way. Learn to, learn to persevere. Okay, and that's what, so the advantage of being in seminary is you get a, you get a chance to preview the ministry, what you're going to get yourself into. <laughs> that's the advantage. You, 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 and so you decide ahead of time if that's what you want to do, if that's what God has called you to do. Because once you're in it, you're done. Uh, Luis, I heard about a barrio preacher in, in East L.A. who was complaining to the people that he wasn't appreciated by the people there. He says, don't you know how much I sacrificed to get to come to East L.A., to the barrio? The job that I gave up and, and the lifestyle that I gave up to come to minister here, and you don't appreciate me? And the, and the people said, the guy said to him, you know what? Nobody asked you to come. Nobody asked you to come, so sh stop crying, <laughs> which is true. What are you wimping out? What are you wimping out? Nobody asked you. You, know what it, you knew what it was ahead of time, and you made a choice, and you did this, so suck it up and let's get on with it. And this is so true when it comes to the gospel ministry. So this section is, is so key to remind us of, of the fact that, that the man should be, should be devoted, devoted. Now notice in this call to preach, there's also what I call the charge, the charge to preach. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, and the charge to preach that we have, it's very simple. Preach the word, verse 2. Preach the word. That's your, doc, that's your job description. Preach the word, the charge to preach. And the whole context of verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and then even the testimony of Paul that fits into that is really part of this, you know, the call to preach and um, Again, thinking of what God has called us to do when it comes to preach, preaching the word of God. Let me allow, allow me to make some observations about this section just by way of, of setting the stage as we think about preaching with passion. Notice the solemnness of the charge, a very solemn, solemn charge. I, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. What are all the qualifiers when it comes to the, the charge, a very solemn, solemn charge? The whole idea is that we answer, we answer to God. That's what, that's what he's saying here. Uh, Timothy, you answer to God for your preaching. You know, he, he's, he's the one you answer to. And someone said, we preach to an audience of one. Who's that? He's in the audience, and so we preach to an audience of one. All we have to do is to please 
him, to please him. I, uh, I took my Greek in uh, Biola University with Dr. Sturz, and he was my Greek professor. Many years later, I was asked to preach at First Brethren Church of Long Beach. And as I got up to preach, guess who sat in the front pew? It was Dr. Sturz. And that's when I realized what it meant to preach to an audience of one, because there he was <laughs> in the front pew, you know, hearing me preach for the first time since I graduated. And here was my professor of, of Greek to preach to an audience of one. And I preached in such a way I wanted to impress him that I, I knew some Greek and I knew how to preach. But to imagine that every time you preach, like God sits in the audience and he's, he's, he's looking at your sermon and, your, and what you're doing and the solemnness of that. And so understand that as we preach, we're preaching not to please people, we're preaching to please God and preaching for the glory of God and the honor of God, that God be glorified in our preaching. And so this task is not something you throw together. See? You don't throw it together. It's something that really you, you, you approach it. So, Timothy, when you preach the word, recognize that, that this is a solemn charge that we're giving you and, and your, your, your answer to God, your answer to Christ. The answer to me, he says, for, for this preaching. And that is, that is sobering. It's really sobering when we think of the task that God has given us. And so we stop and, and think about that. Notice also the fact that it's such a simple charge. Preach the word. Such a simple charge. Just preach the word. And the whole idea here as I think of that that, that the statement to preach the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. That's been our motto. Been our motto, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. And this is basically what he's addressing us, to preach the Word. The source of our preaching is always going to be the Word of God. The, sermon, the, sermons all, the, the content for the sermon has already been prepared for us. The source is always going to be the Scriptures, be the Word of God. And I know in modern preaching, secular preaching and preaching by liberals and others, even among evangelicals, we take our source of preaching from the world, from magazines, from what other people are saying, from the current political climate. We bring that into the pulpit. And so we don't, we don't have a sermon until we get the latest news from, from the Internet or from the public, and then we have a sermon to preach. Well, that's not what God tells Timothy. Timothy, no, the, you know, the, 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 the source of your preaching is going to be the Word of God, Word of God. I was sharing with some of my, some, some special guys that were, you know, rather, rather educated fellows. They were professional people, and I was trying to witness to them, and I, they asked me a couple of questions concerning God and religion, and then I carried a New Testament in my pocket, so I pulled out the New Testament to open up and share with them. And they said, Alex, we don't, wanna, we don't want to hear, we don't want you to read that book to us. We want to hear what you think. We want to hear what you think. And I said, what I think doesn't matter. What matters is what the book says. And if you don't want to hear what the book says, then I have nothing to tell you. So I closed the book, put it in my, my wallet, my, my coat, and sat down because they don't want to hear it. So what I think doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So when we think about preaching, it's not what I, what, what I think. It's not my opinion. It's not my current events. It's looking at, at Scripture. You know, what does the Bible say? And so the content is always going to be the preaching of the word. It's going to be exposition of the word. It's always going to be taking the word of God and explaining it and applying it. That is exposition. Exposition can be defined as simply explaining the Bible and applying it. Explain it, apply it. Puritans, you know, they epitomize that. It was always explain the text and apply the text. They had different ways of explaining it or defining it that would have explanation and then uses of it. Or 
or, or notes or application or observations. I mean, you read some of these Puritans and they'll have an, an explanation of the text and then a thousand and one observations on the text. But it's always the same, explanation, application. Explanation, application. That is exposition. So as you and I take the Word of God, take the Scriptures, we're going to be preaching always, always the Scriptures, expounding the Word of God. Now let me make an observation on the goal of preaching. The goal of preaching. You preach the Word, and there is in the goal of preaching, and he goes on to talk about you know, what we are to be doing with the preaching. But as you examine the goal of preaching, you'll recognize that preaching, preaching is a means to an end. Preaching is a means to an end. Now you say it. Yeah. Exposition is not an end in itself. I know we, we emphasize ex expository preaching. It is like something we just beat into our, our heads. We hammer it all the time versus other types of preaching. We're talking about exposition, exposition. But exposition is not an end in itself. Exposition is a means to an end. It's a means to an end, to preach the Word, to preach the Word because the Word has a purpose for it. There's a purpose for it. Now, I've identified some of these here in our notes. For example, number one, we are to teach the whole counsel of God. Remember the, Paul's message to the, the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20? As a matter of fact, Acts 20.20, 20, that 2020 vision means to be committed to expounding the whole counsel of God from A to Z. The whole counsel of God from A to Z, that is our purpose, to inform the people of God of the counsel of God, to produce then a literate congregation, people that know the scriptures. Gentlemen, one of your uh, major challenges will be this, that you're going to inherit Inherit a culture today in America that does not know the scriptures. They don't know the word of God. They've not, been, they've not been trained in it. They've not read the scriptures. They've not been steeped in it. In, in the 60s, in the, in the last century, it was, it was a given that if you went to church, you went to Sunday school. And you were little taught, you were in Sunday school, memorizing scripture, memorizing the books of the Bible. You heard the stories of all the great personalities, I mean, Elijah, Zacchaeus, all these people. I mean, you were acquainted with that. You went to churches that had services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It was not a question. Public schools would not have anything taking place on Wednesday nights because Wednesday night was Bible study night and prayer night. They never planned anything on Wednesday night. No teacher's conferences, none of that sort. Because people went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they went to Sunday school. In other words, when you were raised in the church, you came to the age of whatever, you were bleeding Bible. Little kid bumped his head, verses came out of his head. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what he was. That is no longer the case anymore. We have folks that go to one service a week, and that's it. And they might get 20, 30 minutes. If they go to a solid church, maybe 40 minutes of exposition, that's all they get. We don't have any Sunday school anymore. That's out the window. Sunday night is gone. Wednesday night, forget about it. So how much Bible will people get? And the average person doesn't attend church every single Sunday. 30% of your people are absent every single Sunday. 30%. That means they're not there. Even for, even for the series, they're not there. So we, you're inheriting a people that are basically illiterate when it comes to Scripture. Uh, sometimes I'll watch, I'll watch Jeopardy. You ever watch Jeopardy? Just to see how dumb I am. You know what I'm saying? I like to kind of embarrass myself to know that of all these questions that are asked, I know very few of the answers. Until it comes to the Bible. And it blows me away how these people do not know the answers to those Bible questions. And they're like the main stuff. And, and so recognize that our, our people are basically, you know, illiterate when it comes to scriptures. Observation? Donald, Donald, Donald yes. So what happened that I'm preaching? What provoked that lack of teaching of the word of God? 
That's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, we need to ponder that. I don't have an absolute answer. Uh, maybe not one entirely. One may be the fact that our people became very, very busy, very, very occupied. I think the, the automobile was part of the problem. People moving far away from churches where it became more difficult for them to come to. The church is no longer a local church. I think the rise of the mega church may also be a problem with that because the mega church basically didn't provide the, the other venues that people needed for, to do that. I think another was the, uh, um, and I, I'm just speaking perhaps just from my own perspective, the laziness of preachers mm -hmm. of not wanting to make other provisions when it comes to Sunday night Wednesday night, it just too, it's just too hard to produce another sermon, another service, and so it became much more difficult. Our culture is becoming more secular, and the more secular our culture becomes, the less they provide, you know, this op these opportunities for us to want to come other nights of the week. I know that having a Sunday school takes a huge amount of effort, and so you need to make it a priority if it's going to work for you. And if it does, if you don't, it's not going to work for you. And so that, that I think, would be one of the reasons why. So not, only, not just one, but all these things came together and then affected the church as a whole. Um, it, it, can, we, can we correct it? Well, it's, it's, just, it's up, up, up to us to find ways to, to correct it. Find ways to teach your people the whole counsel of God. And God has opened up other opportunities that didn't exist in the 60s of, or the last century. Uh, we have, for example, the, the Internet, that people then don't have to go to church to, to get the Word of God. We have, for example, op ways that they can, they can see the sermons, hear the sermons, without them having to attend a local assembly. But we have to find ways to put the Bible into their hands. But one of our goals is for us to teach the Word of God. Okay, to teach the Word of God because our people are basically, you know, illiterate. And the, and the goal is for us to teach the whole counsel of God and be committed to that. And, and that's the goal of preaching, to make sure that they understand the will of God. Now, it can be done, okay? It's uphill, but it can be done if you apply yourself. I don't think you need to give in to just having one sermon, you know, well, I meet with some of our uh, pastors today. They say, so how often do you preach? He says, I preach one sermon a week. A week? Man, how long do you preach? 40 minutes for one sermon a week. That's all you do? Man, it, you sound like a liberal preacher to me. One sermon a week versus preaching three times a week, three, three, three sermons a week. But you have to find a way to, to, to communicate God's word. And so you can do that. You can... You know, in, in 46 years, I've gone through the entire Bible with, with a few exceptions. I haven't, pre I haven't preached through the Psalms yet. Okay, the Psalms are the last treasure house that I have to expound to our people. And then I haven't gone through Ezekiel yet. Okay, so there's Ezekiel that I haven't gone through in some of the Psalms. And aside from that, I've preached through every single book in the Bible. And some of these three or four times, Revelation at least four times, all the Gospels at least three times, Romans at least four times. And so we have, you know, you can, you can devote yourself to the exposition of God's Word. And my motto is, if you come to hear me, I will preach. That's my motto. Whether it be two or 200, it doesn't matter to me. As long as you come, I'll preach the Word to you. And uh, that's the motto. But, but our challenge is an illiterate crowd. So when you get up and you want to say like, uh, like Elijah or Elisha, and they say, well, what, team, what team do they play for? <laughs> like, uh, you know, where are you? And, and that's the whole thing. I mean, folks, it, it gets so bad that people don't take their Bibles to church. I mean, I was over at your friend's church, the Glass Cathedral. Ain't nobody with a Bible there. Even your other friend, the guy over in Saddleback, just to visit, no Bibles, 10 Bibles in two services, 10 Bibles. 
And I could see why, because they never used it. Going to church and one little verse in the overhead, and that was the extent of Bible teaching. You know what that, one little verse, that's not going to do it. You can't have canary tongue tacos and have a meal with that. Just not going to do it. You got to have some stuff in it. And so that's your challenge. So exposition is not just to expose, not just to expound, but it's to teach the word of God, to teach the whole counsel of God. Notice secondly, uh, did I answer your question, by the way? I'm sorry. Okay, done. Yes. And perhaps somebody else has another observation to answer this question that you have <coughs> pondered that. The second observation here is to present every person complete in Christ, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. He says that that's, that's the purpose for ministry is to take every single person, convert them to Christ, and present them complete in Christ, to make them Christ-like. Exposition then is to, is, to, is to present every person complete in Christ, to move them into Christ-likeness. It's a means to an end, a means to an end. So you're asking yourself as we preach, are my people becoming more Christ-like? If they are, then exposition is working. If it is not, then exposition is not working. Okay? And so because it's a means to an end. Just to be faithful to exposition is not getting the job done. Are we producing Christ-like people? Are we producing Christ-like people? And for this, this is a non-negotiable, non-negotiable. And so this is a whole idea of the task of preaching is to produce Christ-likeness in people. And so think about that because that's the purpose. So as we're preparing, preparing our sermons, in the back of our minds is this, that they understand the Word of God, that they know what God's will is, and that they become Christ-like. That's what I want them to do as a result of my preaching. Thirdly, notice it's to present, it's, uh, it's to build up the church spiritually and numerically, Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. It's to be a growing church, a growing church, growing numerically, so preaching is going to result in the conversion of people to Christ. As you present, preach the Word of God, there's going to come, there's going to be conversions. People are going to be coming to this. We're going to expound the gospel. We're going to expound salvation through Christ, and people are going to come to Christ. And this will be the natural outgrowth, outgrowth of exposition of Scripture. That's why Jesus gave us the Great Commission. The Great Commission is really ex expounding the Scriptures, to preach the gospel, to preach the Scriptures, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age, an ongoing process of of numerical and spiritual growth. We need to expect that as we preach, you see. So as we preach the Word of God. And an unbeliever, an unbeliever will listen to exposition. An unbeliever will listen to exposition, especially exposition of the Gospels. I recall I, I, in, in the early years of my ministry, I took aside these stone. I mean, these are like, these are like, Die hard Roman Catholics. These are like, I mean, they worship the Pope kind of people. You know some of these. And, and they didn't, I didn't invite them to church. I went to their, to their home. So we had this Bible study in our home. And all I did was expound the Gospel of John. I gave them all a copy of the same Bible. So we all turned to the same page. And then we just, I just read the chapter. And then I gave them an exposition of John. Just went through and expounded the passage. They're all stone unbelievers, stone Catholics. And one by one, over the span of six months, one by one, all like 18 of these came to Christ, one by one. At the end of six months, they were all converted to Christ. I think we got as far as like John 7 or John 8 in our exposition. And it was just simply expounding the gospel of John, and they all came to Christ. When they all came to Christ, I said, you know, folks, um, I do the same thing on Wednesday nights at our church. Uh, this is an extra night for me, so you're all made a profession of faith. I'll see you on Wednesday night from now on at the church. And so they followed me that night to the church, and they were there. But it's exposition, because an unbeliever will stop in here and listen, and they'll understand who Christ is. 
Notice also number four, Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. The purpose of ministry is to equip the saints to do the work of service. And God gave, verses 11 and 12 especially, God gave apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors, teachers or pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. How do you equip the saints? By the preaching of the word, exposition, for the work of service. They do the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. The church then matures. We are then maturing the church, preparing the church, as you expound the scriptures, equipping them to do ministry. We then are equippers for ministry. The, so the preaching of the word is to equip people to do ministry. You're teaching them so that they can teach others. You're teaching them so that they can do the work of service. So it's not up to you, but it's up to them. Now, now follow me. See, if we adopt a classroom mentality to preaching, you come to going to watch me exposit. You're going to watch me exposit, and that's going to be our little ritual. You meet together, you watch me exposit, and so we exposit the scriptures. We've missed it. That is not the goal of scripture. The goal of scripture is you're going to meet together, and I'm going to preach, exposit the word of God to you to prepare you to do ministry. So getting back to the initial question about Sunday school, I'm going to teach you so you can be a better Sunday school teacher, be better a youth teacher, so you can be able to teach your adult class more effectively, so you can be a better minister to the young married couples that come to our church. See? So in other words, I'm equipping you to do ministry. That is the purpose of preaching. Now, once you recognize this, it totally revolutionizes expository preaching. We have sometimes taken expository preaching and made it just itself an idol. We look at just exposition as an idol, and if we're not expositing, then we just kind of give up. And that's not the whole issue. The whole issue is that it's a means to an end. Preaching is a means to an end. And we've discussed some of these here, some of the major ones that are here, uh, which are to, to reveal the counsel of God, to uh, the whole idea of presenting every person complete in Christ, Christ-likeness, that there be a maturing of believers to equip them for ministry and ultimately, you know, numerical growth and, and spiritual growth. So it's, it's a means to an end. And when you think it through, then it totally revolutionizes the way you approach the whole issue of preaching. Then notice also it's a ceaseless charge. Preach in season and what? Out of season. That means 24-7, 365. <laughs> All right? That's what it means. So listen, once, you're on, once you're on this task, it's like the never-ending task. It's a ceaseless charge. If you'll be ready in season and out of season. And, and there are... The, 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 the Word of God has reminded us that, that our, our preaching is not something aside. It's, it's for us to be ready always to preach the whole counsel of God. And, for example, it's not a profession, not a profession. Gentlemen, we don't do it for the money. Say it. I want you to mark that down because that's going to come to you. You don't do it for the money. You do it because this is what God has called you to do. And so it's not a profession. It's not something that we do it because we get paid to do it. And if we don't get paid to do it, I don't do it. No, it's not that at all. When God calls you to preach, you do it. And so this is why, you know, it's not a profession. I used to tell our preaching class and ministry class, you know, if they don't, if they don't pay you to preach, then you should pay to preach. <laughs> now. I'll pay you to let me preach to you. And, and folks will say, yeah, let's do that, because some folks don't want to pay. Uh, and so in other words, th this is, most churches will not be able to afford you when you graduate from seminary. All right? They're not. They're not going to be able to afford you. And so you have to make a decision. Am I doing it because God called me, or am I doing it because it's a profession? I have to resolve that. You can, only you can resolve that. And so recognize it is not a profession, it's not a pastime, we don't do it as a hobby, it, it's something that, would, that we do it because it's something that we're called to do. I, I, I get the reference of Acts 17, Paul in Athens, the Athenians were there, 
for a pastime. They listened and heard little speeches. That was their pastime. Paul wasn't there as a pastime. He was there to preach Christ. And so when the occasion came, he pulled his sermon out, delivered one of the greatest sermons that ever was ever preached on Mars Hill. And so this is what it's done. In other words, we, we are always on call to preach. You should have a sermon right now in the oven. Right now in the oven, you should have a sermon ready to preach at a drop, drop of a hat. You can right now. Any, every one of you should have a sermon in the oven that if your pastor calls you on Saturday night, Mr. Lopez, Brother Lopez, you're, can you preach tomorrow morning? You would say, yes. I'm ready. I'm ready. Pastor, I was praying for you to get sick so I could preach. <laughs> Something along those lines, you know. But that's the case. Always. Always. It is not done for pleasure. It is not done because you like it or if you feel like it. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 9 and Paul's discussion on preaching in chapter 9? He says, if I, if I preach willingly, I have a reward. If not willingly, I have a what? A duty, an obligation. I preach when I feel like it. I preach when I don't feel like it. That's what he's saying. So it's not something that you always... And, and you know, sometimes, just between us boys here, sometimes preaching is really a chore, and you just don't, you're just not up to it. You're just not up to it. Matter of fact, if you're not careful, we may fall into what they call the tyranny of the sermon. The tyranny of the sermon, you're never done. You finish Sunday night, you go home, and then you're ready for Wednesday night. And then Sunday morning and Sunday night, and you're like forever working on a sermon. Forever. And sometimes like, wow. But you know what? We do it because it's our obligation. And so we never let people know that we don't want to be here. Matter of fact, your job is to make yourself want to be there. Your job is to sit down with yourself and with God and say, Lord, inspire me so when I get up to preach, I want to be here. My heart's in it. And that's what we do. And so we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't preach because we need people's permission to preach. I note Acts 5 there in our example. The apostles, when they were told not to preach, they said, you know what? We must obey God rather than man. And so in some ways, you adopt a model like no one tells you what to preach, when to preach, how long to preach, or how to preach. And when it comes to my, my ministry, nobody tells me what to preach, when to preach, how long to preach, or how to preach. You know. So how long you to preach, Pastor? As long as I have to. What are you preaching on? Wait and see. I didn't like your sermon. Too bad, I didn't either, <laughs> but it's the truth. <laughs> that's all there is to it. You see, in other words, uh, that's, that's what it's about. You know, it's about it's about. And so this is a whole issue when it comes to preaching because we don't, we don't need people's permission to preach. Okay, you already have God's permission to preach, and so get on with it. And then finally, let me just remind us that it's, be careful, it's not a power trip. We're not... We're not preaching to impress people. Okay. We're not preaching to wow them. We're preaching to impact the lives of people. And so always be ready to preach. You know, I'll have a sermon now, ready to preach. And by the way, you will be prepared in such a way that if you did not have to prepare for a whole year, if you didn't have 20 hours a week to preach, to prepare sermons, you'd be ready to preach for the, for the next 50 weeks on the stuff you've heard in class and in chapel, in four or three or four years of seminary. You'll have a whole series of sermons, so be ready to do so. Notice also the serious charge. We, uh, we're called to spiritual change, to change the lives of people. And so we spoke about that in Acts, in, in Corinthians, I mean in Timothy chapter 4, uh, the fickle crowd. The crowd will no longer want to hear sound doctrine, so oh, we're, we're preaching for spiritual change. We're going to be addressing those that are foolish, the fickle, call the wayward back to where they need to be, hardened people, apathetic, all this stuff. We, we, 
We want to preach to bring about spiritual change in the hearts and lives of people. Then notice number five. This is also a sober charge. But be sober in all things, he says to Timothy. Be sober in all things. To be sober means more than just be free from intoxicants. Yeah, it's, uh, it's more than that. We should be free from this stuff, drink, money, sensuality, desire for glory. A sober charge means to be willing to suffer hardship, suffer hardship. And we talked about that earlier. It also means to be involved in doing the work of an evangelist, addressing those that are lost. It means also the whole idea of being single-minded to fulfill your ministry. He, he ends this, we think he ends a section by saying, and fulfill your ministry, except it doesn't end there. The, the testimony of Paul, when he says, you know, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, that is an illustration of what it means to fulfill your ministry. He says, and so take my life as an example. That's what I've done. I fulfilled my ministry. You know, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my, my, my life. I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And therefore, use me as an example for yourself. You know, just get the job done. Gentlemen, make it a goal in your life that when your final days come, when you're done with, with ministry for Christ, you, you don't have any bitterness in your heart. That there's no bitterness. There's no like anger and bitterness and regret. End strong. Okay? End strong. End, end like Paul says, you know, I finished my course that God gave me. And uh, I've kept the faith and I'm looking forward to the reward that Christ has to give me at the end of that. And, and make it a goal. So in the process, don't let anybody or anything affect your spiritual demeanor, the joy of ministry, always keep your heart soft and warm and loving to God and joyful in regards to that. Well, why don't we stop and let's take a, we'll, we'll, we'll come back at 10 o'clock and resume, take a break and get some coffee, and etc. and then we'll come back. And your name is? Steve. Steve.